Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. Well, I hope you're ready to get into God's Word this morning. It's been a great service so far. And I just want to uh, let you all know that Johnny and Janae Stallworth had their baby. Uh, that's awesome. So uh, please be encouraging them and uh, send them a lot of Facebook messages. Amen. Awesome. Well, I hope you will take the time uh, to read today's bulletin. Uh, it's entitled, The Biblical Definition of Belief. And let me get myself. There we go. Awesome. So, so the, less, the article is entitled, The Biblical Definition of Belief. And the sad thing is that in today's religion, most people reduce belief down to agreement. And, and, yet, uh, and yet the article today is geared to help you with your faith. Okay. Because if you increase your faith, you'll strengthen your obedience to God's word. Yeah. And life will go much better for you. Man. If you open up, first you see the picture of, uh, of Tio getting Tio. baptized last Sunday. Yeah. Was that not awesome? I mean, he just came out of the water. Yeah! He was fired up. And uh, it was very special to have his mother here to be able to witness his baptism. That was incredible. Uh, but if you open the bulletin up, I want to share a few things with you. Of course, I'm the picture person because I uh, have a reading disorder, so uh, I love the pictures. <laughs> I always get all the pictures really fast. But uh, this one's really special because, like I mentioned in the announcements, this, sun this next Sunday we have our Bring Your Neighbor Day. And uh, we're in the middle of collecting our special missions for all of our churches around the world. And what Tim did this week was incredible. He took the entire staff up to the top of Mount Hollywood for the staff meeting. But he took us up there not to preach the word at us totally. Uh, of course, there's always a little word. But he took us up there to pray. And so he got us down up there, and we, got, we all got up to the top of the mountain. And as you can see in the picture, he said, all right, now we're in the dirt. Let's get down on our knees. Wow. Let's get down on our knees, and let's go to God and ask him for the victory in these things. Ask him for the strength to be able to push through and accomplish what we say we want to do for the Lord. Amen. It is incredible leadership. Then in the other picture right there, you get to see all the Southland brothers together. <laughs> and, and, and our staff, after we all prayed together, the Southland brothers gathered together. And as you can see there, you can see downtown slightly on the side. But you see the entire Southland area that yep. we have. And so we prayed over the Southland area and the evangelization of the area that we're a part of in this region. Amen. And then I was very grateful to be able to get this shot of Tim. Because we know our ministers are to engage in the ministry of the word. And of course we do that from the pulpit preaching. But we do that in individual counseling sessions. We do that in Bible studies. We do that in what we call discipling times teaching each other to obey everything Jesus commanded. But the thing that can escape people's mindset is the need to pray. And I appreciate the humility of Tim and the God-focused leadership to take us up there. It's just an amazing picture of our leader being right where a leader should be, on his knees, begging God to lead his people. Yeah. And so, uh, and so uh, that you have to have that to understand belief. You have to have that to understand belief. And you have to understand belief to have real faith. And so there's a little equation that I want to call your attention to, and then we'll get on into the lesson here. Of course, faith equals belief. They're, they are one and the same. But if we don't have the right definition of belief, they won't seem equal to us. But faith equals belief, but that will also equal repentance. If we have faith in God's word, we will repent when we see we're not in accordance with it. And that, and that obedience, that will bring obedience to God's word. Now, on the, con on the flip side, disobedience equals unbelief. That means we don't repent. So we don't repent when we don't believe what God's word says, and that is actually the right way, and it will work. And that means no faith. And so most people don't really correlate all those things together. So I, I hope you'll take the time to read the article, strengthen your faith, and I guarantee you, you'll reap the benefits from being more obedient to God's word. Amen? Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's jump on in here. The title of today's lesson is Greatness in the Making. Greatness in the Making. You know, it's interesting. Everyone wants to either be great or do something great. 
And of course, many of us want both, don't we? And yet, everything is backwards in God's kingdom. Why do I say that? Because God's ways are not our ways. His ways go in the opposite direction of our sinful nature, making everything backwards to us when we're not in that mode of being spiritual. And so today, I want us to take a look at one way God made some people great. See, to be great in the kingdom, you need a proper fear of the Lord. And oh, it's not a fear like you think it's a fear. It's not a movie. It's not a big scary monster. It's a loving God who wants to be worshipped appropriately. But, and he makes incredible promises for when we do. But he also has promises for when we don't. And that we should actually fear. But see, from that, grief, that fear, God forms in us an incredible faith. And you've got to have that to be great in the kingdom. You've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life, helping you overcome challenges and persecution. You've got to have a purpose in your life. In fact, you've got to have his purpose in your life. You've got to have a mission. But not just a mission, you've got to have his mission, amen? And you've got to have a heart to serve God's people and a lost world. And... To be great in the kingdom, you've got to have a willingness to give up everything for the sake of Jesus. So far in our Acts series, we've covered many things. A brief overview here. Chapter 1, we posed the question, if everyone in the church were just like me, what kind of church would this be? And then we moved on into chapter 2, and we saw the inaugural service of God's church. What an incredible time that was. Then in, challenge three, in chapter 3, they had some challenges, and they overcame them preaching the message of salvation, a life where Jesus is Lord and Savior of our lives. Then in chapter 4, we saw some men that made it through their life obvious that they had spent time with Jesus because of their boldness, their proclamation, their unity with one another. In chapter 4, it ended in a great, powerful way. They were all one in heart and mind, the Bible says. Their perspectives on their own belongings changed radically. Their belongings were no longer their belongings. They were the kingdom's belongings. Now, if you don't have many belongings, then that fires you on up, doesn't it? <laughs> but yet, if you, if you have many, you know, it makes it hard to see the floodgates, of open, the floodgates of heaven open in your life if you have a lot of belongings. And you're very attached to them. There was an incredible pattern that was happening here. In Acts chapter 2, the 120 had 3,000 baptisms in one day. Can you not wait till we have 3,000 baptisms in one day in God's church? Right. But yet the need of the 3,120 was so great that it caused them to go sell their possessions to meet the needs of one another. And and you know, it's an amazing thing. As we move on just one chapter to chapter 3, Peter and John are out in the courtyard, and they approach a beggar. And and the beggar expected that they give him benevolence. And and yet, his response is very telling of what had happened just from one chapter to the next. Peter said to him, silver and gold I do not have. All that money was gone already. Is that not? Whoa. And and then, by chapter 4, when all this unity is happening, The church is growing. The Bible says that the number grew from that 3,120 to 5,000 men. Is that not incredible? And so, but we come to find that by chapter 4, the money was gone again. Because the leaders had to go back and ask people for more. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that from time to time, people went and sold their home. Nobody does that without being told there's a need. And so they went back and sold their homes. They went back and sold their lands, the Bible says. And they responded to the need that was there by selling those things. You know, it's an amazing thing. When God's people take up the challenge to meet the need of the kingdom, you know what happens? When no one holds back their heart, the needs get met. It's an amazing thing. But, you know, we typically, every year, we take up these missions collections. And... We take a 10-time collection, 20 times what we give every week or whatnot, and we put that money forth. 
And, and every year we'll do that because we have churches in the third world country who will never be able to support themselves. Yeah. And so we'll always take up a collection just for them. But then how horrible if the movement's not moving and we're not sending out mission teams to different places around the world. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. And so we also take up this collection to be able to send mission teams out to different parts of the world. We're very in touch with that here in South Man because next Friday is the inaugural service for the Dubai mission team, amen? It's an incredible, incredible time. We know exactly where that money went. And, and yet, they didn't just give their 10 times. They didn't just give their 20 times. And they didn't put it in a plate. They actually went and sold their home. They took all the money. And they went and they went and they got on there. They put it at the apostles. You know, we can write that off, that they put this money at the apostles' feet. Because we can say, well, they were the apostles. They were awesome. You know, Peter got challenged for being a racist. <laughs> Paul had to challenge him and said he was being racist. James and John, they were the harsh disciples. They wanted to call down fire in heaven when people didn't obey them. Yeah. I mean, these guys were sinful men. They had sinned just like you and me. And yet these people wanted to please God and wanted the needs of their kingdom to be met so much, they still went and put this money at the apostles' feet. That was not a sign of reverence to the apostles. It was a sign of reverence to God. Amen. Well, from time to time that happened, and then the chapter closes out with our first time seeing Barnabas. And Barnabas sells a field that he owns and goes, and he himself just goes and puts the money at the apostles' feet. That brings us to chapter 5. Let's see how all this giving and sacrifice affected the congregation. Because we, we're accustomed in the church here to, to giving of ourselves, and yet how can that affect us once we've given everything? Let's, let's begin in Acts chapter 5. Our first point today is a faith-forming fear. A faith-forming fear. Acts 5 verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Wow. You know, the beauty of all this selflessness, of people selling their items and, and doing this, got marred. Got marred by one man's selfishness. And one woman watching it and knowing about it, his wife. You know, uh, the Bible calls this a sinful pretense. They came to God in pretense. Yeah. What is that? An inadequate or an insincere attempt to follow through on a promise. Wow. Like Achan, see, see, this story about Ananias and Sapphira is to the book of Acts what Achan's sin was in the book of Joshua. Wow. Incredible victory coming, and then wham! Right after all the giving and sacrifice, it made him get a little selfish. I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been there before after giving everything, you know? There isn't a person that walks the planet that is a part of God's church that doesn't get tempted with these things. And like Cain and Abel, with Cain, he came and he did not bring his best. See, Ananias and Sapphira saw an opportunity to make a double profit, if you will. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm sure when all these people came giving all of these gifts, that there was an incredible response to them, an incredible gratitude and a, and a praise that was shown to them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then from time to time, others sold bigger items, not just their little possessions, but their homes and their fields. What kind of praise do you think came from that? Yeah. And, and then Ananias wants to get in on the action. I think I want some praise. I think I'm going to say that I'm going to give what everybody else is giving, but I'm just going to hold a little bit back for myself. And then it comes. He holds back. We can get to that place. Who's going to know if I commit to a mime out for special missions? And, uh, and, and say I'm going to give, but I'm just not really going to hit it. Who's going to know? Who's going to know if uh, I hold back a little money because I, I just want to do some work on my car or my home? See, this is when we're actually truly bringing money to the feet of men, not to the feet of God's altar. And Ananias and Sapphira gave in. Now, I read something today. Maybe you caught it before. I just caught something for the very first time in 23 years and reading it that I thought was really incredible. I never picked up on it that it wasn't really just them together. 
It says that with his wife's full knowledge, he kept it for himself, yeah. not the family. You know, doggone if I went through all the translations and it all says the same thing, that he actually, he himself kept it for himself. His wife just knew he kept it for himself. Wow. It wasn't for the family. This just really hit me. All the selflessness. And just like men can be, Ananias got selfish. And then he asked his wife to hide his sin. Well, let's read on and see what happens. Verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it the sin so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you receive for the land? Wow. You ever notice somebody come on into the fellowship and they just don't look right? There's just something a little off when you look in their eyes. See, in God's church, we look in each other's eyes. We see, okay, it's, there's light in those eyes. Or maybe there's not very much light. Now, maybe you just worked really, really hard that night and you're just really dog tired. You know, that happens. But usually it's, it's not that. Usually a little selfish, the selfishness has creeped on in there. Usually it's the fact that instead of giving our full self to the Lord in every way, we've begun to pull back in some ways. You know what I'm saying? I've been there many times in 23 years. See, here's the thing about it that's so crazy. Withholding part of the money for himself was not a sin. That wasn't a sin. He could have very easily said, I'm going to sell the property and I'm going to give 10% of it. He would have been fine because he made a pledge and he followed through with it. The problem here is that he made a vow to God. See what I'm saying? But the biggest problem is that he made a vow before God that he thought was a vow to men, not God. You know, he approached God in sinful pretense. You know, there's nothing more ugly in God's sight than somebody looking for the praise of men, flaunting spiritual convictions that he or she does not possess. In my day, they called it faking the funk. <laughs> Just faking the funk. Or they called it front, you know? Oh, that There Is a Joy song was awesome. I'm only half black. I'm the, the white part of me comes out there. I could clap, but I couldn't sing with everybody. <laughs> I was struggling. Ricky was laughing at me. But Ananias and Sapphira, they were fronting. They were fronting. They, they said they had convictions. They did not have. They boasted about it before men, but they forgot it was before God. And they approached the feet of apostles and only saw the feet of men, not the throne of God. Today, I pray everything you do, what we give for this special missions contribution, the sacrifices you give, the people you study your Bible with, when you share your faith, that you are doing these things before the throne of God and not for the praise of men. Can I get an amen from the church? Well, let's continue on in verse 5. Let's see what happens to these guys. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. Wow. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and I got for the land? Yes, she said. That is the price. Peter said to her, I imagine he wasn't as hard with the sister. <laughs> but how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. Wow. What a horrible thing. What a horrible thing to put God to the test in, with money the wrong way. I say that because the only place in the Bible that God says test him is about giving our money. And it is a test because it's the closest thing to our hearts. It's the thing we spend the most time going after in our lives. And so God wants every part of our heart. He's a very jealous God. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't need your money. He wants your praise and your honor. And yet, right here, God saw fit to sacrifice two souls for our behalf. Wow. Make no mistake, Jesus was not the only person sacrificed for us. He was the only one that died perfect, 
But every person that has died not saved is a, is a sacrifice for us so that we don't follow their path. Wow. See, nothing helps us understand God more than the untimely death of someone that we know. Wow. Yeah, true. You know, this was not a discipline from Peter. Peter's words did not cause these two to fall down dead. It was a discipline from God. See, that's what always happens when we conceal our sins. That's true. Yeah. Whenever we hide, just like Adam in the garden, and conceal our sins, nothing good is coming for us. The worst thing that you can have happen in your life is that God sees fit to let Satan bless you while you're in the middle of that. Making you not be in touch. That, that blessing is not because you are righteous. This makes me so grateful for my wife, Tracy. I feel for Ananias because he picked a wife that would not tell on him. Let me tell you what, Tracy would have flat turned me in in a hot second. I was going to wait till everybody started clapping because that deserves clapping for sure. I, I mean, in our church, we have what's called disciplers. We help one another be obedient to God's word. We get open with each other. Everyone's a priest, so it's okay to confess to any person. And yet we, we set up relationships so that we can stay strengthened in the Lord. Let me tell you what. Tim Kernan is my discipler. He knows every sin because my wife will turn me in in a second. She will. And, it's, and I feel awesome about that. I want a spouse like that because that's how we get to heaven is helping one another stay open and righteous. And yet, these two tested the Lord with money in the wrong way. Turn to Psalm. Keep your place there. And turn to Psalm chapter 78. Psalm chapter 78. If you're visiting with us today, we don't always talk about money. We just happen to be on the chapter about money in Acts chapter 5. And so if we're going to talk about money, we're going to talk about it the right way, without any shame or guilt. And in Psalm chapter 78, verse 18, we see a little bit of God's heart about when we make vows that we break to him. It says, they willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. Verse 41, again and again, they put God to the test. Look at the way he views this. They vexed the Holy One of Israel. Then over to verse 56. He says, but they put God to the test and rebelled against the Most High. They did not keep his statutes. Now, you see, it's an interesting thing. It's one area of life, but he just makes the generalized statement, they do not obey me, period. Wow. They do not keep my statutes. Like their ancestors, they were disloyal and faithless and unreliable as a faulty bow. Wow. wow. Go over to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. couple books over. For you campus students, just a couple books to the right there. Amen. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 5. Verse 4. Verse 4 through 7. Here's the teaching. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and to not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin and do not protest to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say? And check out what he does and destroy the work of your hands. Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. And check it out. Therefore, fear God. See, Matthew 5, 37 says, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no, and anything beyond that's from Satan. Yeah. And yet Matthew 4, 7 says, do not put your Lord, your God, to the test. But it's interesting what Peter said about them here. How is it that Satan has so filled your heart? Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that Satan can completely fill your heart up with evil? if you don't hold on to a good conscience. Wow. Let me tell you, faith is not something you just have. It's something that you fight for. Yeah. It's something that you, that you fight to keep and that you work to have. Yeah. For centuries, since these times, 
People have come to church, lied to the Holy Spirit, and genuinely, actually, actually expected that things were going to go well for them. You know, it's always when things are going well that the church gets marred by someone's pretense. Today, make that commitment that that will never be you. See, the way that we see this happen today is that you see somebody, and they look like they got it all together, and they speak well, and and they're doing well, and they say the right things, and they seem to be doing the right things, but behind closed doors, it's just a different story. Then all of a sudden, just like a nuclear bomb went off, that person's dead spiritually. You know, we don't see very many people just fall over and die nowadays, but we certainly see people not just fall dead, but fall away. You know what I'm saying? And so this is the reason why we've got to heed what happened with Sapphira here. Sapphira knew about the sin, and she did nothing. She herself had no fear of God's punishment. That when you let sin go on and you don't do something about it, that you're held accountable for the sin happening as well. And so, as disciples, we committed, right, that we're going to be at all the services, the meetings of the body, when we got baptized, right? We committed that uh, we'd come on time even, right? We committed in being taught to obey everything in discipling times. To be devoted to fellowship, be devoted to the prayer. We actually, from Luke 14, committed at our baptism, we were willing to give up everything for Jesus. I hope you're in that same place here today. We committed to a changed lifestyle with a mission to get God's word out to this world. To seek first his kingdom. Today, let's not be religious people that the world expects us to be. Who approach God in sinful pretense, pretending to have convictions we don't have. Remember, this is why we have discipling times. See, right here, Peter gives us an example of a small group leader, what they do. See, the small group leader, our Bible talk leaders, lead the charge in the evangelistic force. They organize the events, the Bible talk meetings, where, we, where people get their first sense about being a part of the church. And they work at the purification. They're on the front lines of purifying the church from sin. Exposing what was hidden in darkness, like it says in Ephesians 5 eight. And so we've got to have a deep conviction to not let these kind of sins dwell in our church. That people are making promises to God, whether it be money or time or energy or whatever it is, and that they're not following through because we know there are consequences coming if we allow that to continue to go on. Remember what God is going for with you today. He's not going for your vision of great. He's going for Jesus' vision of great. The path to greatness is a challenging one. It, takes, it often looks like you get in tough situations where you have no options. And yet 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 says God always provides a way out for every temptation and every option. And I really appreciate our brother Matthew Lovachev. You know, Matthew's taken over. Amen. Matthew has uh, taken over the worldwide CR ministry, not just L.A.'s. And he leads our North House Church, the Incredibles, amen? (laughs) Along with his incredible wife, Marlo. And and yet, you know, I think we can underestimate what people do when they move in. These guys picked up their family in Kansas, and they moved their family all the way to Denver. Then they picked them up again from Denver and moved them all the way again here to L.A. a few months ago. You know, I never heard Matthew complain. Always ready to serve, always be there for whatever's needed. Even today, 7 a.m., he was here setting up for service. I mean, this is a huge man, but he's got an even bigger heart. I love you with all my heart, my brother. Back to, uh, back to Acts chapter 5. Back to Acts chapter 5. Verses 10 and 11. After Peter said these words to Sapphira, at that moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. It takes a great healthy fear of God to have our faith formed the way God wants it. Sometimes he has to let people fall away and fall down dead for us to have that conviction. I pray today you will let the Lord form your faith without having to have people die before our eyes. Secondly, our second point, the faith from fear brings amazing miracles. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. The apostles perform many signs and wonders among the people. 
And all the believers used to meet in Solomon's colonnade. Check this out because of the fear. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded amongst the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Is that not amazing? So these people fall over dead, and everybody's like, I joined. No one else dared to join after that. <laughs> but then the Bible says something happened. There was a faith that was built, and people did begin joining. And more men and more women continued to be added to the church. Wow. wow. Let me ask you, do you think it's a bad thing that God would let people die when they sin against him? See, it had to be to produce a fear and a faith. Yeah. But see, there was something needed with the brother in the church taking the bodies out in front of everyone. Remember in Ezra 9, when the Israelites married foreign women? And in Ezra 10, they made a list of all those who sinned in that way. Why? So that the sin was out before everyone. Wow. See, there's, we're not just a denominational church. Mm -hmm. We're not just faking it. We're actually the family of God. And family talks about issues. Talk, family brings them out before everybody. And family talks about everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. See, what is the beginning of wisdom? Fear of God. Proverbs 9.10. See, there needs to be fear so that we will be the church that God calls us to be. See, sometimes people can have a hard time believing that a loving God would allow their sin to be out there in front of all kinds of other people. And yet we can forget when our sin remains unhidden, when it remains uh, hidden, th there's nothing better for us than for our brothers and sisters to know about. See, we come out of the world, and if somebody knows our business, especially when it's bad, that's really bad. Why? Because we're not family. But when we come into the church, how awesome that others around us that are our family that love us and will tell us the right thing and help us to get there know about those issues so that they can jump on in and keep us from dying spiritually ourselves. The goal is not embarrassment, it's faith. And it takes great faith to form. It takes great fear to form great faith. And, and so here's the thing. We, we get taken back by some of these things. They're, 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 not, they're different from the world. They're different than what we're used to. And yet it's an amazing thing. There's a reason why you're here today. You and me and God all want the same thing, right? We want a real church with real convictions that really follows the scriptures so that we can boldly proclaim there is a truth out there. It's going around the world, and I can be a part of it today. That's why you're here, and that's the church that you come to visit today. Tim says it best, I think. It's not Burger King, have it your way. It's Jesus King, and it's his way. And oh, yes. And oh, yes, it's a big highway and a broad one if it's not his way. See, true sold-out disciples of Jesus get fired up about the truth being preached. And so let's look at what's produced when this kind of faith is created. Verse 15. He goes on here, and Luke writes, As a result, people brought back the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and the mats so at least people's shadows might fall on some of them as they passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick, and they're tormented by impure spirits. And all of them were healed. Wow. Now it's obvious why it needed to happen, right? You see, the knowledge that God was so serious about having a pure and righteous church produced such staggering faith that people just started going out to the towns, the villages, bringing everybody in, just let a shadow cast on them. Like, what kind of faith does it take to do that? Wow. And yet, this is the fulfillment of Jesus' promise in John 14. Wow. John 14, 12 says that we will do even greater things than Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. See, many of us don't believe that. On, and yet it takes this kind of faith to understand you will do greater things than Jesus wow. if you stick around for many years. On, See, Jesus went out and some of the people were healed. He would go heal some. He'd touch some. The crowds would press against him. If somebody got to touch him, they'd get healed. But not so with the disciples. Something phenomenal happened with the disciples. See, if Peter's shadow cast on someone, they were healed. And yet it went even further. They didn't just heal some of the people. 
The Bible said right there, every single person that came was healed. Is that not amazing? That's what God's church is all about. It takes great faith. You know, I think of uh, reading these things make me think of Mario and uh, Bertha Ibarra. You know, they came in and joined us a few, few months back. And uh, first thing they did, they came on in. They go, all right, we're baptizing our daughters. Amen. Done. I mean, they just like blew everybody away. But then they didn't stop there. They started grabbing more teens and more teens and more teens. You know, this last Friday, I think we had, what, 13 teens at our teen devotional because of the faith of Mario and Bertha at Barbara. But not only that, they have taken the bull by the horns here, and they coordinated our first Latin house church service Whoa. last month. And this next weekend, Mario is going to be coordinating again and preaching the word in Spanish right here in Southland. I love you guys. You have incredible, phenomenal faith in the Lord. It is an honor to be with you guys. We're talking about scores and scores of Spanish speakers yep. coming to the churches here yep. in Southland. That is exciting. You know, it can be a tough pill to swallow, but great fear produces great faith. But that faith brings miracles you cannot even imagine. Thirdly, our third point, very simple. I'm a Trekkie. Resistance is futile. <laughs> Acts, Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. When these great miracles start, persecution comes. And the apostles here get persecuted. We're going to read 17 through 40. Then the high priest and all his associates, who are members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. You want to know something? Here's something. I, you know, I wrote this article about the history of our movements. And in, and in doing all the studying for this article, interviewing per person after person after person, has been a part of our family of churches over the years. I came to find a very common thread. The people who could not produce miracles were always jealous of those who did. Yeah. Yeah. And it tears apart churches. Wow. It tears apart Bible talks. It tears apart house churches. And it can tear apart a region if we let jealousy get into our hearts. We've got to be humble enough to learn from each other how to be effective in getting God's word out. <laughs> Since they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night... An angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told. Because when an angel tells you to go to the temple courts, you flat go to the temple courts. You know what I'm saying? They entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to preach to the people. See, that has got to be us. What has God done in your life lately? What did he do when he saved you? We have got to be out preaching the word about Jesus and what he has done in our lives, giving our testimonies of this world. It says when the high priest and his associates arrived, they called the Sanhedrin together. See, the ones who don't know how to do it, they call meetings. See, we call people out of the world. They call meetings to stop the ones that are making the change. It says the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Well, if you know anything about the Roman guards in the jails, what that led to was those guards getting killed. The Bible says, then someone came in and said, look, the man you put in jail is standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force. Why? Because they feared the people would stone them. Wow. Think about your life. Think about what God can do with you. That people will come to persecute you, but be afraid of you. Because what you're doing is so powerful. Remember... Chapter 4, these were average, ordinary, idiot days. They are average, ordinary idiots that were unschooled. And yet here is God opening jail doors for them, making the people afraid of their greatness. Wow. And so, 
says they seized. Oh, I went to the wrong place. Sorry. <laughs> Whoa, lost my place there. Sorry, guys. Yep, 27. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. What a terrible thing to tell a person that they're responsible for the death of Jesus. Wow. You know, because I thought we were. And yet, I love what these average, ordinary guys say. Peter and the other apostles replied, well, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed. You're darn God right, we're telling you it's your fault. <laughs> By hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit. It's always good when the Holy Spirit's your witness, you know what I'm saying? Who God has given to those who what? Obey. Obey him. Wow. Now you know the key. When you have that heart of obedience, you can get the Holy Spirit. But you lose it, you can give it back. You could eventually give it back if you so see fit. But that's where Satan wants to take you. It says, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee near Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Said, Guys, we got to talk here. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, listen carefully to what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him... Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Wow. When God has formed your faith through fear and he is doing powerful things before you, you've got to understand that people who fight you are fighting God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Wow. But can't you see, no matter what they did, it did not work. Resistance is futile when you're dealing with a disciple of Jesus. You know, I, uh, I, I've been so moved uh, in the last couple of months walking with Mason and Natalie and the Wild House Church. You know, uh, what, what he is building there in the Wild House Church is something very special. When you think of uh, Kenneth and Rico and Janelle and Aleem and the campus crew, you guys are incredible. I mean, you got your chance, you got your zeal, you know, what, what is it? Chosen? What? <laughs> you guys are awesome. There's nobody else that really does that. That's awesome. But see, you've got to un understand something here. This faith that comes from a healthy fear of God, that forms miracles, makes persecution from others pointless. There's nothing they can do. There's nothing they can say, and oh, they will try. But remember, the greater the challenge, the more people will be inspired by your great faith. Great miracles bring pointless persecution. And the truth of the matter is, for anybody against it, resistance is just flat futile. <laughs> Lastly, our last point today, greatness in suffering. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. Greatness in suffering. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. That was really dumb to let them go. Because there is no way on the planet these guys were listening to this guy. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. Okay, now, now check this out. What just happened? 
They just got flogged. So they get put in jail. They come back out after having just been flogged. And what are they doing? Rejoicing. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering. Disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah of this world. <laughs> Greatness and suffering. You know, Amer for those of us who live in America here, we avoid suffering like the plague. <laughs> we do. We're bred to be pansies. I mean, we truly are. It's, it's crazy. What is, so what, is, what can greatness ha possibly have to do with suffering then? Well, think about this. Is not Jesus' suffering what distinguished and defined his greatness? It, it wasn't just that he suffered. It was how he suffered and why he suffered. He actually accepted it as if he flat deserved it even though we all know he didn't. You can, like, I want you to grasp this. From the fear, to the faith, to the miracles, to the greatness that follows. God will make you so great that you actually rise above all suffering and persecution. You rise above all suffering and all persecution. You don't have to wait to heaven to not have any tears. You can get to that place here and now if you let your, fourth be, your, your faith be formed. Yeah. See, the, uh, the early church understood its purpose and it understood its mission clearly. Yeah. They never lost sight of their calling. And make no mistake, if you are sitting here today, you have a calling from God. Right. And if you're visiting here with us today, I hope you'll, go, you'll sit down with the person who brought you and study the Bible yeah. with us and find out about this true church that isn't just in this Bible, it's here and now in this very room. These guys never lost sight no matter what happened. From Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, they clearly understood that to be a disciple is to give up everything, suffer whatever God gives, and to rise above it. And he will bless them in every thing. Today, I want you to understand that you can be counted by God as worthy of greatness. Know that a fear from the Lord will give you a faith like you've never had before. Right. A faith that, that, that forms you into the person who God wants. Forms you into this person that responds to people, responds to hardship and situations exactly as his word would have you. That faith will bring amazing phenomenal miracles in your life. Amen. I'm talking not just any miracle. I'm talking he'll bring miracles that would inspire Jesus himself if you let it happen. Amen. Then God takes it even higher, strengthening you so that you can endure all this pointless persecution that people will try and come at you. Amen. And he will bring such greatness into your life and ours that we will be able to continually teach and proclaim God's news, not just here in Southland, not just here in LA, not just in California, not just in the United States, but to every crevice of this planet, till every living creature has heard the truth about Jesus. And they cannot stop us because resistance is futile. Today, that is greatness in the making. I pray that each of your lives will be defined as greatness in the making. I love you all very much. What a terrific day of worship to the Lord. Amen, church? Yeah. Elaine and I bring you greetings from your sister churches in Mexico City, yeah. Chicago, yeah. Dallas, and our newest one in Tampa, Florida. Yeah. Truly, the Lord is moving in great and powerful ways. In Mexico City, they had five baptisms just last week. Um, in Chicago, it's so great uh, to see Pat and Sparkle here. Yeah.
they and all the brothers and sisters from Southland are doing an outstanding job. Um, maybe to put it in perspective, uh, they actually went to a smaller group of disciples in the Chicago church, then they left here in Southland. And that group of disciples is incredible. They have infused that church with such great faith. The Chicago church, literally, in just a matter of two months, has become one of our most zealous, effective, and fruitful churches. Please take that message on back, Pat and Sparkle. It is uh, so awesome to hear Pat and Sparkle. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was touched by your tears because that really is the communion we share, yeah. is, is the relationship. And, and to see the weaving together of all the churches yeah. is just so powerful. And uh, thank you for such a heart seat, sharing from your heart and your life and uh, please give our greetings to the great Chicago church upon your return. I thought uh, Matt did a terrific job on the contribution. What a, what a great addition to the Southland family. I hope that you appreciate both him and Marlo and all the sacrifices. Um, Ron kind of made it easy for you today, bro. Just uh, he priest, he laid it on out. If you don't give, you die. <laughs> but I thought you did an awesome job admonishing us to give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God. The singing was terrific today, too. Uh, you have an incredible group of song leaders, men and women. And uh, thank you. They, they lead in such a great way. Not only are they gifted as far as their voices, but they have such beautiful smiles. Yeah. And I hope you appreciate they really help us to sing yeah. to the Lord. Yeah. But really, uh, what can we say but thank you so much, Ron Harding, for an incredible, incredible exegesis of Acts chapter 5. Um, so many great things here. My favorite point, I think, was Tracy turning you in. Um, you are blessed with godly leaders. And I hope you appreciate that transparency that they have and want to have before the Lord, but before you as well. And that example of discipling is just something we all need to grab a hold of, is the desire to be totally transparent before the Lord. And then just to see when the fear of God came into the church, then the church really started growing and incredible miracles happened. I mean, it's going to be cool when our shadows just produce baptisms all over the place. You know. But uh, thank you, Ron, for an outstanding message. Uh, you are indeed a great preacher of the Lord. Um, I'd like for Elena just to share for a few minutes right here about our recent time in Tampa. Amen. Well, saludos cariñosos. I always have to say that warm, warm greetings. Uh, I grew up in Florida, so it meant so much to me to go back home and to see God's church there in Florida. And, you know, we have one in Orlando that's thriving and doing well. We have one in Gainesville, Florida, where Kip and I became Christians way back <laughs> and met and got married. And just to see God rebuilding the kingdom. And then I am so excited. We got to be just last Sunday in Tampa, Florida. And those of you who have never been to Florida, it's a big state. It's similar to California as far as it's very spread out. And um, there's a sister city to Tampa called St. Petersburg. And I was so grateful. Um, a lot of you know I wrote a book recently called Elevate. And... Uh, and it's a lot about my journey with God and how much God has loved me and taken care of me and how much he wants to do that for all people, not just women. Uh, but my old best friend from nursery school uh, through high school came to church in Tampa. And uh, it just meant so much to me. She's a doctor. She's been through a lot of pain, a lot of hard stuff. That's the world. And she came to church and loved especially the singing. It meant so much because we sing from our heart. And 
you feel the spirit. And then she was very moved by the communion that Elizabeth Eccles did. Um, you know, just to see a woman sharing vulnerably how God has healed her life. And, you know, it's just so powerful what we have. And I hope you don't take it for granted. We have an incredible family that is filled with Jesus. And so many of us come from a lot of wounded pasts. But Jesus heals us. And I'm just praying that God will heal her heart. Um, she's uh, an amazing woman. If it weren't for her, I mean, she taught me so many things. She probably kept me out of a lot of sin and trouble in high school. Um, you know, I owe her a lot, and now I have salvation to give to her. And, you know, I couldn't do it because she lived in a whole other part of Florida that I, we just didn't have a church there for her, but now we have a church. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to be back home. You know, you guys are our second home. I love coming to Southland. I've missed you guys a lot, but I'm so proud of Ron and Tracy and what you guys are doing here. It was wonderful to be in Chicago with Corey and G. They're doing awesome. Your influence is spreading around the world, and I know Kip wants to share some more, but I love you guys. So, so proud of you. Thank you for giving your hearts, and just keep on doing it. I love you very much. Thank you. It really was awesome being there in Tampa and to think we have three churches in Florida now. Yeah. Next year, Lord willing, we'll plant Miami Fort Lauderdale. Oh, that's going to be awesome. And really, the, 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 the team was a very humble team, but it was 18 disciples pulled from the Florida churches and, and many from the Houston church where the Eccles had led previously. Yeah. And we had about 25 visiting disciples, from, mostly from Orlando. But uh, that day, God gave us 126 in attendance. And um, I love that number because Psalm 126 talks about men and women who dream. Amen, guys? So it truly was a dream. They've already had three people baptized in the Lord. God is moving forcibly there. Be praying as well because the Southland influence is not only spreading throughout LA and Chicago, but uh, we'll get to see it in person this coming Friday in Dubai for their inaugural service. Of course, over in the Middle East, we've traditionally always had our services on Fridays. And that's because that's the Muslim holiday. And uh, we've, we've moved the service to the afternoon so it maximizes as many as possible from our former fellowship to also come join us. But uh, I'll be sure to give uh, your greeting to R.D. and yes. April and, and, uh, and everybody else that's over there. But be praying for us because Dubai is going to be our pillar church to evangelize all of the Middle East. Are you with me right here? And then finally, uh, after being there a few days, uh, Elaine and I'll head on over to Manila for a couple of weeks, work with the church there. Exciting things. They've already had over 100 baptisms in 2016. Is that awesome? And there's now more than 200 disciples in Metro Manila, Philippines. God is great. Let's stand at this time. Let's bridge the aisles and let's sing together. Hallelujah.